Welcome to Physics 100. I'm Professor Curtis, instructor for this course, and this lecture looks at Chapter 1 about science. Let's get started. So science is all about asking questions and seeking answers to those questions. And in science, we use a, an accepted approach known as the scientific method. But before we get into the scientific method, let's see what you already know about it. So what I want you to do now is in your workbook, uh, go ahead and fill in these spaces here after you pause the video, of course, and list in order what you think the steps of the scientific method are. When you get done, go ahead and restart the video, and then we'll take a look at the steps of the scientific method. So go ahead, pause the video, and do that now. Okay, now let's take a look. Hopefully this didn't take you too long to do. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the scientific method. Anciently, the Greeks would reason from arbitrary assumptions. So they would, they would make an assumption about the world, and then they would just reason from that point, because the Greeks were all really big into reason, logic, philosophy, that type of thing. So that seemed to work really well for them. However, centuries later, two gentlemen by the name of Galileo Galilei in Italy and Francis Bacon in England were at the same time working with some of the same ideas. They broke with the tradition of reasoning from arbitrary assumptions by pairing experience with reason. Okay, so in other words, it's like, yes, the explanations we have about the natural world around us should make sense, but they should also be based in experience. They should be based in what we can see and feel and touch and know about the world around us. And it shouldn't just be a matter of pure logic. It should be a matter of experience. And this idea is a break from that Greek tradition, and it gives birth to the modern scientific method. In actuality, there is no one scientific method. This is a common public misperception that we have here in society. There is no one scientific method. There's actually different approaches that scientists and engineers use to approach their work. However, there are some common features between those different approaches. The first commonality is that you make an observation. Secondly, you're going to construct a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is an educated but disprovable guess that explains the observation. In other words, you got to have to have some way to test the explanation to see if it really is something that explains the observation that you've made. If you can't test it, then it's not a legitimate hypothesis. And the reason for that is that the next step that's common among the different approaches is to perform an experiment. We have to test the hypothesis to see if it actually explains the observation or not. And then, of course, that experiment will give us results. And the results from that experiment, we then relate back to the hypothesis. Did our explanation of the observation that we make, you know, did it pan out? Is it actually a legitimate uh, explanation for what we observed? Or did our experiment say that it's not a legitimate explanation, that it's not really explaining what's going on, that there's something else at work? It's not really a matter of being quote unquote right or wrong when you construct your hypothesis. It's just about making, going through the process and making sure that experience is what rules the day. So Galileo and Bacon were each proponents of this generalized approach to understanding the way that we, uh, understanding, uh, basically understanding the world around us. And this is what many people think of as a scientific method, but it's really one approach among many. So what we're going to do is we're going to name this approach that we just described after Galileo and Bacon, because they were the first ones to popularize the thinking behind the approach, the idea that experience should rule the day. There are four main steps to this approach, which we've already gone over, but let's go over them again. First, make an observation, or 
Sometimes, you know, you could actually legitimately make several observations, but make an observation. So we observe something in the natural world. We can construct a hypothesis to explain the observation. We then conduct an experiment to test that explanation. Does it really explain what we observe? And the results from that experiment, we then relate back to the hypothesis. Is our hypothesis, hypothesis proven or is it disproven? Let's practice using this Galileo-Bacon approach with a hypothetical example involving a flashlight. So here we have a flashlight. The first step is to make an observation. So the observation that we make when we examine our flashlight is that it doesn't turn on when we move the switch. Okay, that's a legitimate observation. So now the next step in our method is to construct a hypothesis that explains the observation. So we observe that the flashlight doesn't turn on when we move the switch. What would explain that observation? And yes, I'm pausing here because I want you to actually construct a hypothesis. So go ahead. Why would the flashlight not turn on? What do you think? Go ahead and say that out loud. Okay, well, I'm guessing that I can't actually hear you right now, but I'm guessing many of you actually said the batteries are dead. This is why the flashlight doesn't turn on. That's potentially a legitimate explanation for why the flashlight doesn't turn on. But it's not the only possible explanation. Perhaps you actually said that the battery terminals aren't making good contact. If you don't have a complete circuit, the light's not going to turn on. So this is another potential uh, possibility for why uh, the flashlight's not going to turn on when we move the switch. Okay. So <clears throat> once you have your hypothesis, and again, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong at the beginning. It's about going through the process and letting experience rule the day. So regardless of which of these explanations you have, you can proceed through the rest of the Galileo-Bacon approach. The next step is to conduct an experiment to test your hypothesis. Well, if your hypothesis is that the batteries are dead, you could conduct an experiment on the batteries. So hook them up to a multimeter and see how much voltage we have. What's the potential difference in the batteries? Is there enough juice, so to speak, left in the batteries or are they truly dead? That's a legitimate experiment to see if that hypothesis is actually is actually true. If, however, your hypothesis was that the terminals aren't making good contact, well, then we can actually inspect the terminals for our experiment. We can expect their contacts. We can see, okay, is there anything that's, you know, interfering with the circuit? Uh, and because we need a complete circuit in order for the, you know, the electricity to run through and power the light in the light bulb for the flashlight. So we set up our experiment and we conduct it, and that experiment is going to give us results. So we're going to take the results of that experiment and relate it back to our hypothesis. Now remember what the hypothesis was. It could be one or the other. It could be either that the batteries are dead, or it could be that the battery terminals aren't making good contact. Well, if our hypothesis was that the batteries are dead, we tested them with a multimeter. And in doing so, we find that, hey, the batteries are fine. Okay, each of these batteries still has a, a volt and a half potential difference between the terminals. So, you know, they're not dead. And that hypothesis is therefore disproven. And what that means is the explanation that we gave for the observation is not legitimate. It doesn't explain why we observe what we observed. Alternatively, if your hypothesis was that the battery terminals aren't making good contact, you'd ins you would inspect the batteries in the terminals and you'd find, hey, somebody left a piece of tape here on the end of one of the batteries. It's blocking the circuit. The circuit's not complete. So when you remove that obstacle and you put the batteries back in, lo and behold, flashlight works just fine. So this experiment gave us results that prove our hypothesis was true. Okay, so that was the explanation for what we were observing in the real world. Okay, again, it doesn't matter whether the hypothesis is right or not. Some students, they feel a compulsion to make the right guess 
and get the right explanation with the hypothesis. And that's not what this is about. The approach is about letting experience verify how the universe works. Let experience rule the day. So we can make an educated guess, and that guess needs to be something that we can test out, but the testing of that educated guess that we call a hypothesis is the main feature of the approach. We're letting experience decide what is and what is not true. Of course, science is a way of knowing more about the world and making sense of it. This is what the scientific method, so to speak, is designed to, to bring to us, okay? And success in science actually rests more on an attitude than on a particular method. It's not about going through the process and checking off all the boxes as it is having the right attitude. In other words, it's not so much about what we do in science as it is about how we do what we do. So on this note, we want to thank Indiana Jones because in science, a hypothesis becomes fact when experimentation proves it. We have an experiment that proves that our educated guess actually does explain the observation that was made, then the hypothesis becomes fact. And this is where I want you to think about Indiana Jones. Now, can any of you tell me what movie the picture that you see there on the screen comes from? I mean, obviously it's an Indiana Jones movie, but which one? Okay, well, if you said the third one, you're up on your Indiana Jones lore. And if you didn't say that because you didn't know it, then your education is woefully incomplete. You need to take some time to go watch these classic films. This is the third one, okay? This is a lecture he was giving at the beginning of the movie to his students in class. And he was basically, you remember the lecture? For those of you who've seen it, do you remember the lecture? He was saying that archeology span is the search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyman's philosophy class is right down the hall. So this is the essence of what science is about. We're not looking for truth. We're looking for fact. We're looking for experience that can confirm the observations that we make. And when we conduct an experiment that says, yes, our hypothesis really does explain what we're observing, that hypothesis becomes a fact. Facts can then become laws when repeated experiments verify them. So we have other people in the scientific community. They, they conduct the same experiment. They have a similar experience because they get similar results that, again, confirm that hypothesis explains the observation that was made. And so then the fact becomes a law. Laws can then in turn become synthesized together, if they're related, into scientific theories. So notice the progression that we have here. We start out with an educated guess that's a hypothesis. It then becomes a fact when experience proves it. The fact then becomes a law when other people's experience comes together to, to verify it. And then laws that are related to each other can be synthesized together into theories. So in science, it's about experience. Experience is what rules the day. It rules over reason, reputation, popularity, anything else that you might use to establish a fact. Experience is what rules the day in science. So this brings us to our next activity. So in your workbook, without looking back, okay, because if you want to maximize the effect of this to help your learning, okay, don't look back and just list the four concepts that we just discussed right here now. And once you have them listed, rank them in order from least proven to most proven. So go ahead, stop the video now and take care of this activity. When you get done, restart the video and we'll go over the right answers together. Okay, I hope you were able to get this done without a whole lot of time. Let's go through and talk about the right answers. So the first item you should have there on your list, the one that's least proven, is a hypothesis. Remember, a hypothesis is an educated guess that explains the observation that was made. 
Next on the list is a fact. Hypothesis becomes a fact when experience proves it. So we conduct an experiment to prove the, the hypothesis is actually true. And that then becomes a fact. Facts then become laws when other people have similar experiences. So other people in the scientific community can come together and they can verify, yes, we've got similar results from our experiments. So yes, that fact then becomes a law. Laws then become theories when you have similar laws collected together. So this is actually pretty ripe for a potential test question. So yeah, you might want to make sure you understand the order here and not just memorize the order, but understand why they're ordered the way that they are. A hypothesis is an educated guess. When the hypothesis is proven by experiment, it becomes a fact. Multiple experiences then on the same <clears throat> fact turn it into law, and then laws become theories when they have similar that are collected together. Before we end the lecture for the today, let's take a look at uh, some things I want you to understand about math. Now, I've said in the introductory lecture that we're going to focus on the concepts, but we can't get away from the math completely because math is the language of science and engineering, and it's especially true about physics. So, some things I want you to understand about math. Okay, first of all, if you're a little anxious about the math of the course, just understand that if you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, deal with fractions and exponents, you'll have all the math that you need for this course. You'll be just fine. Okay. Again, if you're looking for that hand calculator, which I recommended in the introductory lecture, you know most of the basic uh, calculators that you have out there, um, they're going to be able to deal with these types of operations. So, again, you don't need anything fancy for a hand calculator. Just get something simple. But you're going to do even better in your study of physics if you change your approach about math. Because lots of people look at math as collections of numbers and, and operators. And really, if you think about math more as language, you can actually increase your success in your study of physics. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. All languages okay, are simply sets of associations between symbols and meanings, or what linguists call a signifier and a signified. Let me give you an example. So here we have a picture of an object in the real world. Okay? And if I asked you to identify this object, okay, you would say, well, that's a chair. And okay, you'd be right, that is a chair. But that word chair is simply a symbol that English speakers use by convention to represent the actual object in the real world. Okay, there's nothing that says that that chair has to be called chair. There's nothing about the chair that's crying out to be called chair. I mean, after all, people who speak Spanish would not say chair. They would say la silla. Or people who speak French, they would say la chaise. I mean, these are just different symbols, different languages, or different sets of associations. You've got different symbols to represent the same object. You've got different signifiers to represent the same signified. So all language is, is a convention of this set of associations that we're going to say, okay, if you speak this language, then what that means is we're going to use this symbol to represent this actual something in the real world. Okay, And there's nothing right or wrong about which symbol you're using for your representation, because they all mean the same thing. They're all legitimate representations of what we see in the real world. Well, math is the language of science. It does the same thing. It communicates concepts in the same way, but it does so very compactly. And this is why math is the language of science. Okay, So in science engineering, when you see a mathematical expression, each variable and term in the expression represents something in the real world. It's a signifier representing a signified. We have an observation that we make 
in the real world, and those observations are represented by the symbols that we see in the mathematical equation. It's a language. So the equation then becomes a relationship between different concepts that we're trying to communicate. Let me give you an example of that. I could use English to say the weight of an object is the product of its mass and its gravitational constant. But if I use math to communicate the same idea, I can do so much more compactly. So W equals mg is saying exactly the same thing as the sentence above it. And we can see that each of these symbols represents something in the real world. So W is representing the weight of an object. M represents the mass of the same object. And G represents, it's just a constant that's related to the pull of gravity. So here we have a mathematical expression that is symbolizing something we see in the real world. So by looking at this mathematical expression, I can tell you, okay, the weight, if I know the mass of an object, I can give you its weight, or vice versa. If I know the weight of an object, I can give you its mass. Uh, I could also tell you that weight and mass are not the same thing, because if they were the same thing, the expression would be W equals M, and you wouldn't see the G anywhere. But, you know, we see the G's, and G's, well, if G is 1, they're going to be the same thing, but G is not going to be 1, at least not on this planet. So, yeah, we could say that there's a difference between mass and weight. And that's an important concept that we'll get into later in the course. So you can see here, it's a very compact way to express concepts that comprise what we're studying in science. And so this is why math is the language of science and engineering. And so if you look at math as a language, you, you can improve your study of physics because all the concepts that we're going to study are represented in the math. Again, we're going to keep the math to a minimum, but if you look at it as a language, then you can be much more successful in your studies of physics. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. Uh, I hope you found it helpful. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.